Thanks, Rob and Heather. Appreciate that very much. Turn to Judges chapter 16. Judges 16. Did you notice the ushers tonight? They all matched. They had on dark suits and they all had blue shirts on. Looked really sharp, really nice. Maybe we should make that like a requirement. They all have to wear the same outfit. Maybe not, just kidding. Uh, they look good. Appreciate their hard work, all the things that they do. It's good to have uh, some friends with us. Um, well, they're friends of friends, I guess you should say. They're children of friends, because I don't know these two very well. But we have Ruth Ann and uh, Elizabeth, right? No, okay. So you can tell how well I know them. Okay, Ruth Ann, is that right? And then the other one was, I totally lost it. Bet, what is it? Becca, that's right. <laughs> Man, I'll never forget it. Anyway, these are parties, and uh, their uh, dad is uh, one of the assistant pastors. He's up at uh, Falls Baptist Church, Baptist College of Ministry up there. And I uh, appreciate them and their family. My wife, actually, you knew them in uh, Lansing, right? Yeah, they are up in Lansing. So my wife knew them uh, from up there. Uh, their family, they have like uh, 27 kids, I think it is, something like that. <laughs> Not really. There's just seven of them, but uh, it's a big family. Uh, and uh, I've, I've got to know the uh, um, later years of the children in the family. So I don't know all of them that well, but I uh, know a few of them. So anyway, it's good to have them here with us tonight. And I'm glad they came to uh, be a part of our service and come down to visit Miss Cheney there. Is she being nice? Okay, I was just checking, making sure she's a good host. You don't need anything, do you? Okay. I figured she would provide everything that she needs, so. Anyway, which one of you is in the pack and play? I'm just kidding, never mind, that's good. We provided the pack and play for them, that's why I asked the question, but anyway, okay. Judges chapter 16, Judges chapter 16. And I am, um, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm about done with the book of Judges. There's four or five more chapters in the book after this, but some of these stories I quite frankly don't want to discuss and uh, because they are a bit disgusting. I'll let you read through them, but uh, some of them, they're pretty graphic and I'll let you read, read them at the end. And um, pretty much the children of Israel just continue to fall away into idolatry. And uh, after this is over with, after Samson is done, and um, just some pretty hideous things happened in the land of Israel at that time. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end my series of Judges with this uh, sermon tonight. But uh, I want to talk one more time about the life of Samson. And we're going to look down at the end of chapter 16, verse 30. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon all, on the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. Okay, now go back to chapter 15. And you're going to look at the last verse, the end there. The last verse, chapter 20. And it says, And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Now go back to chapter 13 and verse number 1. Chapter 13, verse 1. And the children of, Israel, children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now, they were under bondage, under the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. But uh, Samson, at the same time they were under bondage, was still judging the children of Israel. And he judged them for 20 years. Now, normally, the judges would uh, throw off the bonds and the bondage and get them out um, from underneath that tyranny that they were under. But that wasn't the case with Samson. The reason is, I believe, because like we talked about last week, the children of Israel didn't want to get out from under bondage. However, uh, the Philistines, uh, the, uh, the children of uh, Samson, <laughs> Samson uh, still judged the children of Israel for 20 years. Now, the Philistines continued to plague uh, the children of Israel for years and years after this. Uh, if you remember, even in the days of David, uh, they continued to, to be a, a thorn in the side of the children of Israel, continued to cause problems uh, day in and day out. If you remember, 
one of the mighty men of David, or one of that passage that talks about the mighty men of David, three of them, uh, David uh, was standing there near his hometown of Bethlehem. And uh, Bethlehem is not that far from Jerusalem, but his hometown of Bethlehem. And he said, oh, that, that one would get me a drink of the water from the well there at Bethlehem. You remember that story? And three men broke through the garrison of the Philistines at Bethlehem? Well, yeah, it's because the children of Israel didn't throw off the bondage, uh, the bonds that they were underneath, and uh, decided they were going to be free, okay, and serve the Lord uh, wholeheartedly. And so the, the, the Philistines continued to cause problems for the children of Israel uh, years and years later. However, the Bible does say that Samson began to deliver the children of Israel from out of the hand of the Philistines. And this was one of those, uh, this was one of those cases where the, the children were still in bondage, but the judge was ruling and judging in Israel. And uh, given what Samson had done to the Philistines, were they going to come and question him? No, <laughs> because they would have all died pretty much. Samson was that powerful, okay? So um, it's kind of an interesting concept here, but he judged Israel for 20 years. Now, I want us to think about something here for a minute. How was Samson remembered? Having thought about that and laying that groundwork as an introduction, how was Samson remembered? And what was he remembered for? Okay, I hear all of these things going thrown around here. He was known for his strength. But what name do we associate with Samson? Delilah. Now, why did you say Delilah? Because that's how Samson's remembered. Uh, if you uh, talk about the story of Samson, you don't talk about Samson and the 300 foxes. No, no, no. You don't talk about Samson and the jawbone of the donkey. No, no, no. You don't think about him, Samson, and the gates on the top of the mountain. No, you say Samson and Delilah. Because those two go together. See, that's how Samson was remembered. Now, that's just us in our human minds, but I think that's also uh, by design, because uh, we are remembered uh, by certain things, and it may not necessarily be the thing that we want to be remembered by. Um, but now, think about this for a minute. Did he not judge the children of Israel for 20 years? Was there any part of that 20 years that was good? Yes. Yeah, of course. He did a lot of good. He was used uh, mightily in 20 years. But that's not what people remember about him. Sadly, people remember Samson and Delilah. Movies, documentaries, cartoons, television shows have been made about not just Samson, but Samson and Delilah. If you put in a, a search in a, um, a database or something like that, you will find that there are numerous examples of uh, these uh, Hollywood shows or whatever uh, that, uh, that star not just Samson, but Delilah. They talk specifically about Samson and Delilah. Uh, let me just give you an example. Um, there were movies, documentaries, cartoons, or TV shows made about Samson and Delilah in the years 1902, 1908, 1911, 1922, 1949, 1959, 1961, 1978, 1981, three times in 1981, 1984, 1985, 1986, 1995, 1996, twice in 1996. 1998, 1999, 2002, 2005, 2007, 2008, and this and next year, 2017, another video, movie's coming out. But it's not about Samson. It's about Samson and Delilah. That's how Samson's remembered. <laughs> now you think about that. It was a sad ending for such a remarkable life. 24 total titles and countless other episodes of shows named after Samson and Delilah. Well, that's obviously the world's take on things, but that's also how we remember him. Samson was associated with Delilah in his death in the latter years of his life, and hence that's how we remember his life. 
but for 20 years he kept law and order in the children of Israel. I don't remember that. People remember him most about Delilah. Now, let's just think about this a few, uh, a few more minutes here. If we were to mention some more Bible characters, what stories come to mind about these other Bible characters? There's lots of different ones. How about Abraham? Okay, his son Isaac. All right, how about Jacob? Esau. Now somebody said Esau there. Now why do we think of that? I mean, Jacob, after all, became Israel, didn't he? But the very thing that we remember about Jacob is Esau. <laughs> I mean, he, he did live a wonderful life after that. Uh, but for some reason, we think about him and Esau. How about Absalom? Long hair, treason. That's what we think of with Absalom. How about Demas? Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, that's all that we know about him. But we do know that Demas was a good man at one time because he traveled with the Apostle Paul. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So there was some good there. How about Gehazi? You might know who Gehazi was. Who was he? Elisha, Elisha's servant. Uh, that was uh, the story of Naaman. Now, what do we remember about uh, Gehazi? He got the leprosy that Naaman had. Now, did Gehazi do any good in his life? Well, of course he did. He was the servant. He took the staff and stuck it on the Shunammite woman's face, uh, son's face, the one who had died. Uh, he ran ahead and did that. He did all sorts of things for the Lord, for Elisha, for the prophet. But we don't remember him for that. We remember him for being Gehazi, the guy who ran after Naaman and, and tried to take some of his money out of greed. How about Achan? Achan, the man who took the accursed thing in Jericho and was killed as a result. Did Achan do a bunch of bad things in his life? I would say probably not. He probably did one thing that was really bad. And to be honest with you, it probably in their minds wasn't really that big of a deal. Now, it wasn't God's eyes, obviously. And that led to the deaths of some other people and the children of Israel when they decided to go to Ai. All right, but the point is, Achan is remembered for that one thing. Did he not walk around the walls of Jericho 13 times? Did he? That's not a hard question. Okay. Did he walk around the walls of Jericho 13 times with the rest of the children of Israel? Yeah, he did. Did he show faith at that moment? Yeah, did he show obedience to the Lord at that moment? Yeah, so was Achan a really, really bad guy? Probably not. He did one thing that he should not have done, uh, direct disobedience to the Lord, and that's what we remember him for. How about uh, Balaam? Remember Balaam? What do you think of with Balaam? The donkey. It's funny how certain things just come to our brains, don't they, when we think of certain names? Balaam and the donkey, the talking donkey, the donkey that shouldn't have been talking. <laughs> How about Solomon? Now, this is going to get some responses here, okay. How about Solomon? What do we think of with Solomon? <laughs> you know, all sorts of things here. Of course, he built the temple, but most of the time, what do people think of with Solomon? This is wisdom. Too many wives. Okay, somebody said that down there. That's what a lot of people think of, isn't it? Well, that was obviously what happened in his latter years of his life. Now, God used him. He was a powerful man, mighty man of the Lord because of his wisdom. But Solomon, nevertheless, had a tragic end. How about Isaiah? You know what I think of when I think of Isaiah? Here am I, send me. Woe is me, for I am a man undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. That's what I think of with Isaiah. How about Mary? Mary, the mother of Jesus, a godly woman. How about Paul? 
Paul, the great soul winner, the great man of God, the things that he did in his early life is not what we remember and think about. We think about the fact that he was a great missionary and God used him in a powerful way. That's what we think of with the Apostle Paul. How about Peter? A man who, yes, had some faults as a disciple of Jesus Christ, but he ended his life uh, being somebody who we could look up to and emulate, humanly speaking. See, these names bring certain images to our minds. They also give us a certain idea about the person based upon what we know. And in our human minds, we automatically draw conclusions about those people uh, and based upon what we think. You know, the same thing is true about people in history. I'm not going to belabor the point here, but just think about this. If I name a name, what do you automatically think of? Adolf Hitler. Benito Mussolini. How about uh, Joseph Stalin? We don't think good things about them. Pol Pot. You might know who that is. Dictator of Cambodia. Queen Mary. Became known as Bloody Mary naming the bad ones here. Henry VIII. Too many wives. So I keep coming back to wives. Okay, there we go. Henry VIII. Women problems there. What is it, eight wives? Is that right? Henry VIII had eight wives. Okay, there we go. Um, let's, let's, how about Bill Clinton? Anyway, let's, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't go that direction. Okay. Um, I, I, I could say a whole lot there, but I'm just going to kind of move along. All right. Um, how about Ronald Reagan? Yeah, I've heard everybody say, oh, he's the man. Okay, but just think about it. Did he end well? What do we remember about Ronald Reagan? He was a good man. We remember his presidency. Okay. Um, about Joan of Arc? Burnt at the stake. Yes, okay, so remember. Uh, Wild Bill Hickok. Mustache. Okay, that's what I think of. Uh, <laughs> how about uh, George Whitfield? George Whitfield. Jonathan Edwards. Preachers. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Jonathan Edwards. Famous sermon. The First Great Awakening. Tremendous, powerful preachers in the First Great Awakening. Um, David Brainerd. Missionary of the Indians. My... One of my relatives, actually, he's like my great, 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 great uncle, some sort, way back uh, years ago. See, all of these names we come up with, we think, uh, we, we know people by the way, usually, that they ended, particularly the latter years of their lives. So, in other words, we remember people by how they end. Not necessarily how they begin. Now, there's exceptions to that. Like you think about Jacob. When we talk about Jacob, we think of Jacob and Esau. Okay, but we don't think of Jacob as Israel. Now, if I was to say the name, what do you think of the person Israel? Then you would have a totally different concept in your brain. But we think about Jacob, we think of Jacob and Esau. But that's kind of the exception to the rule. Usually, you remember people by how they end, and that's, that's really the, no different with Samson here. Now, what are some ways that people have passed off the scene in Scripture? Think about this with me. First of all, they passed off in shame and tragedy. Think about the man Korah. What do you think of with Korah? You think of a man who rebelled against Moses. Did you know... Uh, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 21, he was the son of Izhar. Uh, he was also that made him the son of Levi. But who was Izhar's brother? His brother was Amram. And who was Amram? You might know? Moses' dad, that's correct. So Izhar was Moses' uncle. That means that Korah was Moses' cousin. Now, Korah had position. He was a man that was important in the children of Israel. And so important, he thought he was more important than he really was. Yet he rebelled against Moses and thought he could do something. And as a result, 
uh, he, um, he ended up in a, a fiery grave. His pastor talked about this morning. Korah, what a sad, sad ending. Shame and tragedy. How about King Saul? King Saul started well. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 6, And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he went out there and he won a tremendous battle. The Spirit of God was used. Uh, used Saul in a powerful way. But we find these words in 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 4, 20 chapters later. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. That does not sound like the actions of a spirit-filled man. In fact, it sounds like a man who dies in shame and tragedy. But that was King Saul. How about Balaam? The sad words of Balaam, he was a prophet of God. He was a man who was used of God. But in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, we find these words about Balaam, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. In the book of Joshua, he's called a soothsayer. Well, how did he get to that point? His life ended in shame and tragedy. About Absalom, the man who had the long hair, decided to commit treason against his father, and as a result ended up dying a horrible death in shame. About Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 11, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart, for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build in high place for Shemosh, and uh, abomination, the, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. He did them all. <laughs> And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burn incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Died in tragedy and shame. Why? Because he decided that idolatry was more important. And he was... He was involved in all of the worst idolatry you could imagine. Molech, Ashtaroth, these were gods of child sacrifice, as was again mentioned this morning. It was awful, awful, horrible, the way he ended. So some people end their lives in shame and tragedy. Others end their lives in obscurity. And this is not necessarily bad. It just means that the Bible doesn't say how they passed away. We think about the faithful servant Barnabas. Well, Barnabas was a man of God who the Lord used in his life. He was a man that was filled with the Spirit of God, who was a man full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, is what the Bible says. Used of the Lord to help the Apostle Paul uh, uh, train him to be the, the preacher that God wanted him to be. But well, Barnabas... Um, after he had his confrontation with, with Paul, he went his own way, and Saul went his way. And we never hear from Barnabas again. Now, that doesn't mean that Barnabas ended a life in shame and tragedy. It just means that he ended in obscurity. We don't know anything about what happened after that. Caleb, after taking the mountain, he lived for several more years and died still a faithful servant of the Lord. But we don't know much about the details of his death. You know, David could have been used so much greater in his life had it not been for his wickedness. And his life is kind of just a coasting to the very end. Nothing spectacular happens at the end of David's life. How about her and Miriam? 
Uh, Miriam was Moses' sister. She was a prophetess, the Bible calls her, one of the only ladies in the Bible given that title as a prophetess. And yet uh, nothing, is, nothing more is really said about Miriam except for his de her death. And we don't know anything else about her, uh, who many believe was Miriam's husband. We both were used of the Lord, but nothing more is said about them. After a certain point, they just pass away in obscurity. Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, died, but we have no way of knowing how. We have no account of that. We have no idea. He just passed off the scene. Remember Hezekiah? A man who had been used of God in a powerful way to bring the nation of Israel out of their idolatry and uh, bring a huge revival and awakening to the, to the land of Israel. He finds out that he's got a, a sickness that will kill him, a fatal disease. And he turns his face to the wall and he cries and says, God, will you please spare my life? And Isaiah comes back and says, God's heard your prayer. He's given you 15 more years. Now, during that time, Hezekiah went and showed uh, the king of Assyria all of the, oh no, no, king of Babylon, he showed the, the, the king in the Babylon there, all of the beautiful um, uh, treasures in the temple. And Isaiah come to him and said, did you show it to him? Yes, I did. He said, well, God's going to come and take all those away. He's going to take the children of Israel captive. And Hezekiah's response was, well, as long as it's not during my reign, that's okay. That's how he responds. And Hezekiah basically passes off the scene and dies in obscurity. So some people die in shame and tragedy. Some people just pass off the scene. But then there are others who actually die in victory. They die in victory. They die having ended their life well. Think about Joseph, a man who could have many times uh, fallen away from the Lord and gone the wrong direction. Many times he was tempted to do so, but Joseph maintains his integrity through the whole process. And as a result, Joseph uh, ends his life in victory. Moses was the same way. We find at the, end of the De at, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we find that this says, there, comes, there came not a prophet after Moses who knew, who knew the Lord face to face. He was an inspired man. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of God. And Moses died having lived his life well. Joshua was the same way. The man who followed Moses. A man of great character to spend 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain waiting for Moses to come down. That showed a lot of patience. That showed a lot of character. He could have left. He could have been gone like Aaron was down at the bottom of the mountain. He was gone. He was out of there, down with the children of Israel, causing trouble in Exodus 32. But Joshua didn't. He stayed. He was a faithful minister of the Lord. He earned his title as leader of the children of Israel. And through the end of his days, I'm sure Joshua made some mistakes, but through the end of his days, Joshua glorified God through his life. And he ended in victory. You know, I think of Saul's son, Jonathan. Jonathan was a man who stayed true to the Lord, even though his father didn't give him a very good example to follow. Jonathan was a man of God, a man of faith, who died, I believe, in a tragic way, but he died having lived his life well. I think of the Apostle John. John died in the Isle of Patmos. He died in exile. But John did not die having compromised what he believed or fallen aside uh, by the way. He didn't do that. No, he stayed true to the Lord and he died in victory even though he was in bondage. John the Baptist, a man who was uh, the prophet that was to come and to prepare the way for the Messiah. A man who, who yes, was beheaded in prison, but he was a man who served God with all of his heart right up to his last breath. The Apostle Paul. Well, I tell you, a man who went right to the, to the chopping block, if you will. 
I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me in that day. And not to me only, but also unto all those who love his appearing. Paul lived his life to the fullest, to the very last breath that he took. Peter was the same way. Tradition has it that Peter watched his wife being led out to be crucified. And he told her to stay true to the Lord. And then Peter followed as well a little while later. And he said, I don't want to be crucified like Jesus Christ. I want you to crucify me upside down. Because I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus was. But Peter died in victory. He died having lived a wonderful life of ministry for God. Of course, I can't help but mention in this section about Jesus. Jesus died in victory as well. When Jesus yelled on the cross, it is finished. That was a cry of triumph over the devil. All these people, they died in victory. I don't know about you, but I don't want to come to the end of my life and die in tragedy and die in shame. That's not what I want. I want to die having lived my life well. I want people to remember me for being a good person, not a bad person. Not for being dishonest, not for being this or being that. I want to be known because of the way that I lived my life for the Lord. Amen. Now, I haven't been perfect. Uh, I can tell you that. My wife can tell you that. My kids can tell you I'm not a perfect person. By all means, I'm not. I don't claim to be. But I can tell you, I want to be used of the Lord to the day that I die. I want to be used of God, and I want to end my life well. How can we do that? Well, we should end right with the Lord. There's nothing greater than to have that peace that passeth understanding, to know that you are right with God, to know that there's nothing between your soul and the Savior. We should do everything we can to maintain our relationship with the Lord now so that we stay right with God, right to our, our final breath. When we do fail, we need to get up and continue on with the Lord's help. Are we going to? Yes, we are. I was talking to somebody the other day. They were just feeling weighed down about their sin. And they said, I just, I just don't think I can live for the Lord. Well, yes, you can, because the Bible says so. Psalm 37, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way, though he fall. It's not a matter of if you're going to fall, it's a matter of when you're going to fall. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You know what God wants you to do? Get back up. Get back up and keep going for him. Maybe somebody in this room who has a hurt relationship with another brother or sister in Christ. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a relative. Maybe it's a parent. Well, you know what? Your life isn't over. You need to get right with God and go forward for the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. God wants you to do what is right. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. She didn't make those things right. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. That's what we need. So we need to end right with the Lord. We should also end in fellowship with God. And obviously, we need to have a relationship with him. But we need men and women of prayer. Is there anybody you know that's alive today? You could point to that individual and say, you know what? That's a man or a woman of prayer. I know some people like that. I've been privileged to be with those people. I've been privileged to pray with those people. I tell you, it's wonderful to step into the presence of the Lord because of somebody who's praying. It's on praying ground. I tell you, there's nothing like it. But that's the way all of us should be. When we step into a prayer meeting, we should know that we're stepping into the presence of God because we have men and women who are on praying ground. And look, that's not just for some of us. That's for all of us. Because all of us are believers. We should be men and women of prayer because we are in fellowship with the Lord. 
that really should be all of our desire. And also, we should be knowing the Word of God back and forward. Every day, we should be hearing from God through Bible reading and prayer. So we should end in fellowship with the Lord. We should end serving and pleasing others and God, not ourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 tells us that the household of Stephanus was known for being addicted to the ministry of the saints. Addicted to the ministry of the saints. We need men and women who are addicted to the ministry of the saints, who are looking for those people that they can help in our church and also looking out to people in the community. It's interesting to me, let me go back to Samson here for a minute. Judges chapter 16, look down at verse number 28. Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee. Only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. What was Samson's request of God at the end of his life? It was a request of vengeance. It was a request of revenge. God, strengthen me so that I can be avenged of the Philistines. Why? Because of my two eyes. It wasn't so that God could be glorified and honored. No, no, no. It was because of my two eyes. That's why. God, I want strength so that I can be avenged of my two eyes. Now, we can look at this and go back and forth about this, but I think that's a pretty selfish request, don't you? But that's how Samson died. He died in vengeance. No, God enabled him. And God gave him the strength to do that. I, I agree. And God used him even in his death to help judge the children of Israel. But his motive was wrong. And his goal was wrong. God... Give me strength so that I can have revenge. See, he wasn't interested in serving and pleasing others. He was interested in pleasing himself. And that's what revenge does. We should be pleasing God with what we do, not ourselves. Finally, we should end in faith. You know, it's interesting... I think just about every single sermon that I preach, I end up talking about faith. Doesn't that seem to be the case? Well, the reason is because that's how we have success. We have to depend upon God for everything. Faith is the key. Living in dependence of God is the only way to live. And it's the only recipe for success. We need to be men and women of faith. See, if we don't trust God, then our trust is in the wrong place or the wrong person. If we trust other people, which is sometimes the case, we get into situations, ministries, or whatever, we think, oh, I'm going to trust in that person. That person knows what they're doing, so I'm going to, I'm going to rely upon them to do the job and do it well. Well, if your trust is in that person, again, that's in the wrong place. And what will happen when things go wrong? Well, then we blame that person for what happens. See, the trust can't be in people. If we trust ourselves, we will keep failing. And we'll be, keep living a frustrated Christian life. But if we trust in God, we will succeed because he is the only one that can help us. And he is the only one that can empower us to do what God wants us to do. So, let's just sum this up here quickly. Some of us are at the end of our lives. I could be at the end of mine. I don't know. You could be at the end of yours. How did you live your life? How are you going to live your life? Are you going to end well? 
Are you going to live like Samson, who died in tragedy, his very last breath? He's crying out for revenge. Crying out to avenge his two eyes. Or are you going to live in faith? Are you going to end in faith? Believing God that he can do through you what you can't do for yourself. Back a few weeks ago, my uh, former director, my former boss, Dr. Earl Jessup, went home to be with the Lord. And uh, Dr. Jessup was a man of faith. He trusted God, and his story is quite remarkable to see how the Lord used him in, in tremendous ways. He wasn't a perfect person by any means, and neither was I, but God used him. And um, neither are any of us either, but uh, anyway, God, the Lord used him. Um, I watched the funeral um, back when it was on. It was, it was on live, and uh, so I was able to watch it through Facebook or whatever. And uh, so I'm, I'm sitting here watching the funeral. One of the things that they had, uh, this was very, very touching, very moving, but his daughter and uh, son-in-law were in his room right before he passed away, the night before. And they recorded, without him knowing it, his final prayer to the Lord. I tell you, you talk about moving. <laughs> it was... A prayer of faith. Basically, well, he was dying of lung cancer, and they had given him, you know, a, a several days more to live. They didn't think he was going to last more than a week or two. But in his prayer, he said, Lord, I've done everything that I can do for you, and I'm trusting you to take me home right now. I'm ready to go. Here was a man who ended well. And the next morning, about 6 o'clock, God took him home to be with the Lord. Took him home to be with him. And I believe it was because of his prayer of faith. See, Dr. Jessup ended well. Can that be said about us? I hope it can. If not, you know what? We can certainly do something about it tonight. Maybe you're depending upon yourself for everything. You need to get that right with the Lord. Maybe there's something between you and God that you need to make right with Him. Well, why don't you make it right tonight? Maybe there's something between you and another brother and sister in Christ. Don't leave this earth without having taken care of that. Because that's how you'll be remembered. Will you end well? Lord, help us tonight to take these truths.